So I'd like to uh, uh, welcome you to this penultimate seminar for this autumn term, uh, and uh, which we're very pleased to have Luke Shepler here to give. Uh, I'll do a little bit of the housekeeping now, and, uh, and then Pippa will take over and introduce Luke. Uh, as per usual, we'd like you to mute your computers and to turn off your videos for the duration of the talk. You can turn them back on again after if you want uh, when we're doing the questions. Uh, we'd also like to remind you that uh, the questions, if you've got questions, do write them in the chat box, either while Luke is speaking or at the end, and then Pippa will um, relay them to Luke. Uh, and we have to do it that way, as most of you who've come before know. So I think that's all the practical matters. So I'd like to hand over to Pippa to introduce Luke, our speaker for this evening. Yeah, hi. Um, well, so far this, uh, in this series, we've, we've been looking at how plants and garden styles and ideas have been making their way around the world. And, and quite often that's just been about one way traffic. Um, but this evening's paper is very much about a two-way exchange and, and specifically involving Japan and Britain in the late 19th and early, early 20th centuries. Uh, our speaker is Luke, Dr. Luke Scherpler, who recently completed his PhD entitled The Meiji Legacy Gardens and Parks of Japan and Britain, 1850 to 1914 at Derby University. Luke's topic grew out of his master's dissertation, also at Derby, which focused on representations of nationalism and national identity in Japan after the Second World War. And this in turn must have been informed to a certain degree by a first degree in psychology. So it's a great pleasure to welcome you, Luke, and thank you very much for agreeing to share some of your research with us this evening. Um, may I hand over to you? Thank you. Yes, sure. No, thank you. No, yes. So yes, as uh, as Pippa said, it was this uh, talk today is going to be based off of my uh, PhD thesis that I completed uh, last year with the uh, Viber examination in during uh, the first lockdown. Uh, so I will be talking, obviously, as Pippa said, it's the kind of cultural exchange and looking at how ideas around Japanese gardens were transmitted across to Britain in the Edwardian, Victorian, Victorian Edwardian era, and also in the same time, the Meiji era in Japan, how uh, Western styles of parks and gardens were being uh, used and uh, employed in Japanese parks and gardens. So it's kind of like looking at the two-way exchange rather than uh, kind of a lot of previous studies had looked at the kind of purely the kind of aristocratic, uh, consumption of Japanese uh, culture in the same era. So obviously looking at that, I'll explore how the Meiji era and Victorian Edwardian politics shaped how they were, these respective garden park design ideas were transmitted and interpreted in Japan and Britain, because there was a significant role, particularly as I'll talk about later in the, uh, the monarchies of both countries, King Edward VII in particular, and obviously Emperor Meiji, and I'll uh, also look at the how the two societies, the Asiatic Society of Japan, which was based in or formed in Yokohama in Japan in the kind of mid to late 1870s, and also the Japan Society in London that was formed 20 years later, how they were involved and important in transmitting ideas around Japanese gardens um, in, and also Western ideas, but crucially for kind of the species, they, they were mostly focused on the, the Japanese or Japan gardens in Britain. Uh, and also in, linked in with that, the Anglo-Japanese alliances of 1902, which uh, King Edward VII and uh, during his reign in the Edwardian era was uh, a big impetus for spreading ideas of, uh, of kind of Japan, escaping some of their the kind of early prejudices and being perceived as a kind of on par with Western European powers. Um, I'll, I'll briefly introduce kind of the, the, the setting for those that aren't familiar with um, the, the pre-Meiji era 
which uh, obviously feeds into to what Japan was reacting against and uh, what uh, where Britain was at the same time. And also discuss how the Edo and Meiji era garden modern was uh, modern at that time ideas shaped which types of Japanese garden were being produced and replicated a lot in the British Isles and also how uh, in um, to another degree how they were also being infiltrating into Japanese gardens in Japan. So, as I said, I'll briefly briefly introduce kind of Japan during the from 1600 up until uh, 1854, were in a what was called Sakoku, which was a closed policy, a closed country um, edict, which was a reaction against Portuguese missionaries. Um, kind of overstepping the mark. Um, obviously, I could go into more detail on that, but that's sort of the, the main impetus for them deciding to become isolationist to a degree was um, because of this, the kind of Christian missionaries. Um, so Japan was, whilst not completely cut off from all uh, international discourse and trading, uh, was for all intents and purposes not willing to enter into any trade or negotiations or even kind of contact with any countries apart from continuing trade with China and the Dutch East India Company. So you kind of go from this, this period of time where Japan is, is kind of avoiding contact with outside nations to 1852 when uh, Matthew Perry, uh, Commodore Matthew Perry's uh, from America comes with the, the ships to off the shore of um, and sails up into Tokyo Bay and kind of demands that they will start trading in, with other nations and start signing treaties and not stay this closed nation. So, but during Sakaku, they weren't completely cut off. Uh, as I said, the Dutch East India Company um, had the monopoly on, on that, although they could only trade um, and send ships once a year. Uh, and had to were confined to uh, an artificial island which was off the coast of Nagasaki in the south of Japan. Uh, but a lot of which kind of feeds into how my uh, dissertation and my research is plants and um, kind of procuring medicinal herbs and med for medicine uh, was a, a big impetus for uh, the Dutch East India Company, but for getting Japan to open up because it was physicians and plant hunters such as uh, Engelbert Kempfer and um, Karl Thunberg and Franz von Siebold who went, joined the Dutch East India Company and were able to get into Japan with one of their main aims being to get hold of plants and see what flora there was in the kind of less known, probably one of the least known places uh, left on um, on the planet. So plants were a big commodity and a big draw for uh, these physicians and members of the Dutch East India Company for getting into Japan and being able to establish trade and not not have these boundaries. So when, uh, as, as you can see on the, the image that I put up, this was from the Commodore Matthew Perry expedition where they listed in the uh, all the attempts to of other nations, particularly the Dutch and uh, English and Russia, uh, to get Japan to open. And obviously, the, down the bottom you have the uh, the American attempts, which uh, spans a, a shorter period of time and then inevitably ends in success in 1854, uh, when Matthew Perry basically forces Japan to reopen or, and start trading and entering into politics with and negotiating trade deals with the rest of the world, uh, or mostly the Western powers in this case, uh, obviously because China, China were able to um, continue trade. So you kind of, obviously you go from, from Japan um, opening to, I'm gonna kind of go back on myself ever so slightly, uh, with the uh, Japan garden categories. This is kind of how I'm going to frame the, the talk uh, 
and then I'll talk about the Western styles of park and garden in Japan um, after I've kind of discussed how various types of Japan garden were, or Japanese, Japan garden as I term them, uh, Japanese style gardens in Britain were conceived and what was driving like a, a variety of different styles and layouts and uh, because what became clear as I was researching more sites and um, places around Britain that uh, claimed to have Japanese gardens or Japanese areas was there was there were quite distinct um, different trends and into interweaving reasons for why those particular sites were as they were and the term Japan Garden, I, I will say, I probably shouldn't say stole, but rather borrowed uh, a term from a, a book written in 1819 on the White Knights estate in Reading, the Duke of Marlborough's estate, who was a, a wealthy uh, aristocrat who had uh, in, in the descriptions in the book, he had a obviously Dutch style gardens, he had a Chinese style garden area. And he also had what Barbara Hoffman described as the Japan Garden, which was basically a square filled with Japanese and American plants. And this is obviously pre-Japan being opened to trade in the West. So all the um, information that the knowledge that we've had on Japan would have been solely from the physicians' accounts from the Dust East India Company, which were there were copies published in English, and which actually the Duke of Marlborough had some of those in his library so i kind of I, I liked the idea of it being a japan garden rather than a japanese garden because it, it kind of it reflected that these weren't japan japanese gardens being built in britain rather it was this was the representation of japan in the garden so i kind of used that to encompass all of them because in, in some way, all of the gardens were trying to replicate an image of Japan rather than necessarily a traditional Japanese garden as was often attributed to them. Yeah. So the first grouped a few of the categories together for kind of ease of of talking, but the first two I'm going to talk about are the uh, the gardens of plants and bonsai, uh, which, as I said, the Duke of Marlborough's was the sort of the earliest one that uh, wanted to differentiate itself from Chinese gardens or Oriental gardens um, by having a Japan garden, and you see lots of these ones that are just in in um, old uh, horticultural magazines and uh, newspaper articles, uh, you'll see that uh, Japan, a Japanese garden area mentioned, which normally, you do, and when you look into it, it was it would actually a lot of the time be a garden that had a lot of Japanese plants in it, but they designated it Japanese because it was unusual enough to uh, warrant calling it the Japanese area and to kind of in, inspire some interest in the, in the gardens. The other common and the precursor to the Japanese garden was, of course, Ch Chinese garden areas, style areas um, in the image. Um, this is a Chinese style garden rather than a Japanese uh, style, but there were plenty of gardens attributed it as Japanese style that followed this uh, a willow plate pattern um, in the top in the right hand corner. It's the, this was a very common pattern that you'll see in lots of um, porcelain and uh, Japanese and Chinese uh, vases and goods um, from the kind of 17th and 18th centuries. And uh, they were very popular. And uh, obviously, Shogra Hall in the uh, image on the left, you can see the kind of literal translation of this bridge over the river uh, with the pagoda or, or Chinese style house uh, set, set slightly back with um, some plants and shrubs, often bamboos and uh, other kind of more commonly associated with uh, China or Japan or the East uh, interspersed around. Um, and this was, uh, an, uh, of course, through the course of the research, um, Southport um, in particular threw up quite a few 
Japanese areas in uh, some of their parks and gardens, obviously being a seaside resort. Um, this particular one was Heskid Park. Although um, for this particular um, postcard or image, I, I was trying to research the site and it's um, on their archive. I kind of, kind of found this uh, reference to a postcard of the Japanese area, Heskid Park. That was the only Jap Jap Japanese related thing I could find on the site and uh, right, so rather than uh, go there I saw that they had a, a way to pay two or three pounds to get the image of that was um, in the archive but actually going there and they gave me this image which I will confess I struggle to particularly see what is Japanese about it however I, if I'm being generous you can kind of see a river um, kind of streams and maybe an, an island here at the bottom and I presume some of these would be Japanese plants but this this again kind of like uh, kind of shows the problem sometimes when trying to research what what is in a Japanese area and what's a Japanese garden it you kind of often get these places that are, have just got some Japanese plants in them uh, in in an earlier period of um, the histories from Japan opening, and then you'll end up with uh, with like a postcard like this that's designated a Japanese garden, but then not uh, not in any obvious or, or clear way. Now, exhibitions were another big way that Japanese garden and uh, like architectural art was transmitted to the, like Europe, Europe and uh, Britain as, as many people will have heard of like the, the Great Exhibition in London. Exhibitions and international exhibitions were big forums for nations to kind of show off and showcase at, like how modern and advanced they were. Like there'll be lots of industrial and art and architectural uh, displays and other countries could display at them. And Japan, after op after opening, and particularly once uh, after their own political internal kind of turmoil, and having Emperor Meiji ascend the throne in 1867-1868, you see Japan very much um, opting to participate in these. Ex, like international ex, exhibitions and expositions, which we could showcase and show, try and show Japan in a, a positive light and begin to get, show that they're a power like on par with European nations, and not another Oriental or, or kind of backwards uh, Far Eastern nation that the, the labels had to be kind of thrown at China and India and uh, various other ones that succumb to kind of empir emp empirical uh, empire incursions. And indeed, um, that Japan even started exhibition doing exhibitions in Japan from about 1877. So. 10 years after the, the Meiji restoration, when uh, Emperor Meiji uh, ascended the throne, the political power was shifted to Tokyo. Uh, so at Oeno Park and uh, Park in Kyoto and Osaka from uh, 1877 to 1904, they held national industrial exhibitions in Japan and the, in the park sites. And here you'd um, see them showing how advanced Japan was to the Japanese population uh, by, by showing how they'd learnt things like Western agriculture and uh, and in, in industrial like buildings and so a lot of them they'd kind of build brick buildings with obviously Japanese buildings traditionally are timber framed and um, show that Japan was modernizing and was uh, going and getting into a, a better position in, in kind of the world standing and, and also as a reaction to show that um, opening up to world trade wasn't necessarily the bad thing that obviously many in other sides of the, the political system st would st still had their doubts and uh, wanted Japan to go back to being 
um, closed nation policy. So in this uh, particular image, uh, um, found uh, Bromborough Hall in Cheshire, which uh, doesn't exist anymore. But the owner, William Forward, went to one of these uh, international exhibitions at St. Louis in the USA, uh, where, one, where Japan had probably one of their bigger Japanese garden exhibits. And on his return to Cheshire, he decided to try and recreate that. Um, the images here, it's it's slightly hard to tell maybe, but it's it's almost, if you reverse the image round, you can see uh, it's used the, the stone lantern in the distance with the bridge and uh, the Yatsuhashi uh, Hashi zigzag bridge is kind of in the top left, uh, slightly obscured and with the island, uh, with the kind of Japanese plants uh, put across it. But this um, mimicking what was seen at the exhibition site, they obviously made a big impression on particularly the aristocracy who had the money to build and, uh, and try and re recreate what they'd seen. Um, obviously not so much the British public, but there were uh, other smaller exhibits that um, you were able to as, as members of the public uh, in park spaces and attractions with like Tanaka's Japanese village, which uh, had kind of geishas and uh, kind of a small scale Japanese gardens and uh, traditional arts and crafts uh, that toured the countries in the late 1800s, so about the 1880s. But the main exhibit and what Japan was building towards, particularly with the, um, the Anglo-Japanese alliance that I spoke of earlier, which was kind of represents the peak of Japan at their, that they were able, they kind of had a success against China in 1895 in the Sino-Japanese War. And in 1905, they beat Russia in the uh, Russo-Japanese War, which um, kind of, alerted, I suppose, the European powers that Japan was was perhaps now a power on, on par with Europe and uh, to be dealt with differently to how they dealt with um, in like China and India. So Japan was always working on this uh, kind of learning from the West, learning from Europe, learning from the United States as well um, on how to to modernize and and trade with uh, other other nations and, and kind of gain a political foothold in this uh, what was a, a kind of empire centric on the part of uh, the British Empire. Um, but the first Anglo-Japanese alliance was signed in 1902, which kind of gave Japan protection for their interests of empire in Asia, such as Korea and uh, parts of uh, Manchuria and China, and um, also the. Um, Sakhalin Islands that they'd won. So in 19, when they re-signed in 1905 uh, and updated the agreement, it was to protect against Russia retaliating for having been defeated in the Russia-Japanese War. But uh, the, the culmination of this was the Japan-British exhibi exhibition in 1910, which was staged in uh, Hammersmith in uh, London. I mean, Japan had wanted, they wanted to host it in Japan initially, but couldn't get the, or quite work out the logistics or the funding to, to make that happen. So they co-hosted what was kind of an Anglo-Japanese event. And the showcase was these two Japanese style gardens that they laid out in uh, Hammersmith. Obviously very showpiece and um, elaborate styles of of Japanese garden with kind of replicas like the the red house on the uh, above the waterfalls was a replica of the Chikoshimon gateway which is a a bigger uh, structure in Japan itself and it was kind of very much an immersive uh, experience like the the houses around the edge and um, they served tea in and it was uh, very much a kind of representing Japan as an experience for people that would come to the exhibition and these gardens obviously had their, had they had a impact on similar to the way that uh, William Forward at Bromborough Hall wanted to replicate what he'd seen on his own estate 
there were a lot lots of uh, estates in well, several estates in Britain that replicated what the Japanese gardens at the Japan British Exhibition in 1910. Uh, so Yule Castle in Surrey was a, a chief offender to this cause. It was a kind of miniaturized version, but it was the literal translations of both of these gardens. Um, so I'll talk a bit, a bit later about the kind of how the modern styles of Japanese garden fed into this because they weren't, this is where it becomes again another type of Japan garden in that they weren't necessarily designed to traditional Japanese lines. The, they were designed by Japanese designers in uh, Kinkachura Honda and Keijuro Ozawa uh, designed the two gardens, but they were heavily, uh, particularly Kinkichiro Honda, who um, was kind of heavily biased and interested in uh, European types of park and garden. So he infused a lot of those ideas into the Japanese garden that were made at the Hammersmith in White City for the 1910 exhibition. So the gardens weren't, pure, weren't necessarily purely Japanese, which was also acknowledged at the time by many of the uh, delegates and uh, Japanese officials that were helping promote and work uh, to get the event, uh, make it a success. They acknowledged it was Anglo-Japanese and that they were, they were symbolic of the friendship between Japan and Britain, rather than necessarily being uh, traditional or proper representations of Japanese gardens as they would be found in Japan. So obviously that in itself has uh, a big effect on how the gardens that were inspired by them, obviously the Yule Castle in Surrey, it was um, more of a, a tribute and a literal translation. It was a similar thing was done at Peace Home Park in Scarborough uh, a bit later on in the 1920s and also um, uh, at uh, Rivington Hall, uh, which was another later one where they literally recreated what they'd seen in Scarborough. It's like the, it's got the, the kind of pagoda on top of the waterfall uh, surrounding the lake, uh, similar to uh, the uh, left-hand image of the garden, but the floating aisle um, is very much based around that archetype. Whereas at other places like Tatton Park in Surrey, uh, the uh, original gardeners from that worked on the uh, Hammersmith site for the 1910 exhibitions were employed to make a Japanese style garden for uh, Lord Edgerton on his estate in uh, Cheshire at Tatton Park. So but this garden, it was a much more, uh, I'd say, original take. It didn't just copy what was seen, but it kind of blended lots of different things like a Shinto shrine and uh, a Mount Fuji mound um, and um, tea house uh, set around the winding stream. So the kind of, it was very much uh, another kind of showpiece garden, but it wasn't uh, a reconstruction of the exhibition gardens. So the impact of the 1910 exhibition gardens was, was quite profound, in, certainly in terms of um, the elaborate forms of Japanese gardens that were, or Japanese, Japan gardens that were being uh, created around Britain but also how they were sort of based on a model that wasn't necessarily a, a strictly Japanese or purely Japanese uh, one. Now, souvenir gardens, probably the biggest category that I came across because there's such a, there was such a broad range of these and they pretty much stemmed from um, as you can imagine, it, people, uh, people particularly with money, like arist aristocrats or kind of the more wealthy in the British society, going to Japan and visiting a lot of the tourist trails. Those be like uh, Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka, Nara, um, and uh, Nikko was probably the main offender. Uh, but they would want to bring back souvenirs, as was the kind of the 
I suppose the the Orientalist uh, approach of kind of going and taking things back uh, um, to remind of uh, having been to these places. So on the, on the left hand side here uh, of the the images of uh, Sedgwick Park in Su in Sussex, which uh, for all intents and purposes is kind of a geometric water garden with kind of clipped hedges. Um, but they brought back a sole Japanese lantern and placed that in the scene, which uh, obviously doesn't make it a Japanese garden, but it it does, the kind of stone lantern does immediately draw your mind and does bring an image of Japan. So it kind of becomes a Japan garden, whether they intended to or not, because it's got this Japanese lantern set within the water garden scene. And on the other extreme, you have Lapa Castle in Cumbria, which uh, he brought so much, so many different things back, as you can see, like lots of stone lanterns, bonsais, uh, lots of Japanese bridges. And uh, I think he, he, he employed a company that was able to get hold of a lot, of, uh, procure a lot of Japanese plants and um, uh, ornaments and garden structures, such as the tea house, which is in the back. And the, um, it was, I think it's described as being stuffed full, full of curios the mementos of his travels to Japan. But souvenir gardens were, like I say, were the most widespread because so many were able to enter Japan, particularly in the 1890s, um, when the political situation had settled down a lot more and it was more actively encouraged by, I suppose, by both governments. Um, And then there's also uh, images that were very popular in um, horticulture magazines, such as Country Life, um, which provided both well, provided both of these images. Although the image on the left is from uh, is actually from a garden in Japan, um, and that was taken by um, uh, Kei Ogawa, who provided images for a, a book. Um, by uh, Josiah Kondo, which I will I'll talk about in a bit more detail shortly. Um, he was very key in um, spreading uh, and kind of popularizing uh, Japanese gardens and understanding of Japanese gardens in the West. But as you can see on the right hand side, uh, this is at uh, Buckhurst Park in Surrey, uh, completed around 1908, where they've again literally got gone from the photo, and even the country life photographer has gone to the trouble of taking the photo at the same angle as the Japanese one was. Uh, so here you can see the, the literal translation of um, kind of seeing, a, seeing an image of a Japanese garden and then using that as a guide to then build, build one on uh, a British estate. And uh, a lot of these images were widespread um, and kind of recirculated in uh, kind of horticulture magazines like uh, uh, particularly Country Life and uh, Gardeners Chronicle and other um, magazines and uh, periodicals. And the societies um, I will talk about now, like I said, Josiah Conda was a, a key figure, uh, particularly with relating to Japanese gardens from the Asiatic Society of Japan, because uh, he worked in was employed by the Japanese garden to advise in architecture and um, helping them build uh, Western style buildings in Japan. But he took an interest in a lot of other areas of um, Japanese um, culture. And now the Asia, Asiatic Society of Japan was born, uh, kind of born out of this initial, Japan is open to trade and open to foreigners uh, with the Yokohama becoming the kind of key treaty port um, along with uh, Nagasaki and some of the others, but Yokohama was the main hub where um, all the foreign diplomats and merchants uh, kind of set up their own homes. In fact, there's, there's still, they've still got the, a lot of the original homes and uh, Western style homes like European houses that they'd uh, built in the, what's known as the bluff area in Yokohama. So to which, in which they've kind of got their own like European style gardens, like. Um, English gardens and, and such. But the Asiatic Society of Japan uh, sort of embodies this ori these Orientalist beginnings. It's kind of Japan is a, a place to go to to be 
um, have resources to be harvested and uh, kind of have things to gain from. So like the, they were set up in 1872 to um, basically disseminate and learn and share as much knowledge as they had gained about all aspects of Japanese culture, like including such things as uh, like road networks, uh, some of the uh, um, history of the typhoons and the weather, and, um, and obviously gardens was uh, one such topic that um, eventually sprung up. And it wasn't until um, Josiah Kondo did his um, initial talk before them, like he'd done someone at Ikebana, like flower arranging and other similar topics, but he uh, studied a lot of um, Japanese texts at the time, which I'll, again, I'll go, I'll go into a bit later because it, it feeds into the, the Nuashi, the um, self-styled garden ex, uh, experts in Japan that uh, propagated these uh, ideas about Japanese gardens um, in Japan and how that also uh, came across to Britain. But uh, Josiah Kondo, based on these, released a book um, titled Landscape Gardening in Japan that detailed all the known knowledge of Japanese gardens. And while this, while I argue this wasn't necessarily conducive to being a guide for making a Japanese garden, it was certainly, uh, he was the renowned expert on Japanese gardens, like uh, from a European um, and American uh, standpoint. But uh, the, on the right is the Japan Society, which was formed in 1891, who were kind of equally as important in so far as this is the kind of a period of time, as I said, the 1890s, all the tourist trails, there's a lot more tourism to Japan from the wealthy and um, aristocracy. Um, but it was also a time where Japan was kind of getting more ground and more concessions. By 1895, they were able to win the wars against China and uh, kind of a military might as well. But the Japan Society was formed in London um, with the involvement of Japanese uh, dignitaries and individuals and was endorsed by Emperor Meiji uh, himself to kind of help promote Japan in a positive light and improve uh, political standing uh, kind of from within London, rather than the uh, Asiatic society, which is obviously based in Japan itself, this kind of moved the center across to London so they could begin to have talks on Japanese culture to the, a wider proportion of, um, of uh, British society. And that in turn uh, encouraged Japanese gardens, Japanese style gardens to be um, created. A lot of the owners and the, the, there was a lot of uh, movement between the societies, those who had worked in Japan uh, would then join the Japan Society. Um, a lot of them would build their own Japanese or Japan gardens at their estates. There are also places, as you can see, for uh, this, the Japan Society's garden party for, for kind of socializing and improving um, relations, um, which was held at, uh, I think this one's at Regent's Park, uh, where, they had, where they had that photo taken in London. So Lord Reedsdale was uh, one such member, so his, his garden is uh, the, the image on the left. He uh, was, a, was a key figure in uh, kind of early um, diplomatic and uh, ne negotiations of, uh, after Japan had opened and there was a lot of political upheaval, he, he went across uh, to Japan and stayed there for a number of years uh, as a as an envoy and and kind of negotiating um, with uh, kind of Japanese officials. But he was uh, he also joined um, was a good friend of King Edward the Seventh, which uh, is significant date later on. But he brought back kind of similar to a souvenir garden, some mementos and um, as you can see, like there's a Japanese palm in there as well. But he, he had a keen sense of horticulture and kind of blended these Japanese ornaments within his garden, but always um, in accounts uh, in his memoirs, he um, denies that he has a Japanese garden and always says that he doesn't because they're difficult, such a difficult uh, um, thing to understand by a European or a Westerner. 
and uh, so he sort of there acknowledges that his garden although he's put some japanese ornaments in it isn't a japanese garden it's more it's like this is a, a japan area within his wider gardens um structure and one step on from that uh, there was a several articles by a gardener called uh, ps hayward who um created what i termed hidden gardens because he the image on the right there of the the rock gardens doesn't have any images that would make it instantly stick out as japanese because he, he didn't intend that to be so he'd kind of uh, he, he wrote some articles on kind of dwarfing methods of uh, trees and the co composition of um, Japanese rock gardens and how it, you can learn from the techniques and take from that to create a Japanese garden rather than putting a stone lantern or necessarily having the physical emblems of Japan in the garden to instantly say this is a Japanese or Japan garden. So these hidden gardens are obviously more difficult to find except for a couple like this um, in this case, because he's, he wrote articles about them um, at this um, so-called Holland House in uh, Southcliffe. So there was the kind of the one extreme where you have a, a Japan garden where just the plants are being proclaimed as making this a Japanese garden to a garden that is built along Japanese lines using some of the techniques in terms of composition and uh, arrangement, but without outwardly looking Japanese. So it's kind of the, that's where the two scales of, uh, I suppose my Japan garden categories lies. It's, you've got these ones with all the emblems or the symbolic, um, instantly you you'll draw associations with Japan on one end and these ones where it's kind of more hidden and uh, meant to be not as obvious like that it's it is inspired in some way by japanese gardening traditions or techniques so yes um the anglo-japanese alliance hybrid gardens uh these are the ones that are particularly related to king Edward the seventh because whilst there were Jap japan japanese style gardens in the victorian era it was the edwardian era that really saw so from 1901 onwards you saw a real kind of explosion of japanese style gardens around and a lot of that was down to the anglo-japanese alliances and this um this drive to forge good diplomatic relations with uh, with japan this wasn't always uh, the case so, i mean queen victoria didn't hold any particular regard for japan um in fact one of her coronations some of the japanese dignitaries or one uh, not coronation sorry one of her um uh, commemorations of uh, how long she'd been on the throne. She was uh, the Japanese royalty that came across to London were dismayed that they kind of weren't treated as um, in it in a way that would befit the rank of uh, being a similar royal family. But this this obviously changed with um, the um, Edwardian era. So it's like he sent lots of um, like his close friends, like uh, the Earl of Sandwich, uh, to go uh, and meet and socialize and uh, kind of keep cordial relations with the Japanese government for the kind of mutual benefits of both both nations. Um, I'll quickly have to go across to so the garden on here so it's one that King Edward ordered that um, ironically was constructed shortly after he um, died in 1910 in 1910. Uh, by a company called Carters and Co, but it's it's this kind of archetype that a lot of King Edward's friends um, imitated. And um, the Holland House is not so obvious, but again, this like this this was their their Japanese garden, which had the stone lamps in some Japanese plants, but was otherwise not in any way resembling those in Japan. Uh, and similarly, uh, we've got Rufford Hall in Nottinghamshire on the left, which um, sadly no longer exists either, but it was um, frequented often by King Edward VII. And uh, in the press, there's lots of accounts of his praise of the site. And uh, this is where you get lots of this, uh, um, the knowledge of, that he was keen and a keen admirer of Japanese garden style. 
Um, similarly, Hinchinbrook House, which is the Earl of Sandwich, who I mentioned earlier, he uh, went across to Japan and uh, tried to recreate a, a Japanese area. But interestingly, with these ones, the kind of gardens that he was seeing again were of dignitaries that were in Japan that were replicating European or British style in their gardens. Uh, hence why you've got kind of these lawns and um, these English features kind of juxtaposed with the uh, Japanese cranes and uh, um, stone lanterns and bridges. Uh, it was very much a, a kind of hybridized spaces. Um, yeah, like I said, uh, the Niwashi, um, I'll talk very briefly about, they were the Japanese garden, self-styled Japanese garden experts that um, went around Britain and uh, kind of spread ideas, uh, went around Britain, sorry, went around Japan in the uh, kind of late Edo period, um, so early 1800s. And a lot of the texts that Terji Zaikonda lists um, in his book, uh, Landscape Garden in Japan, were informed by um, the vast majority from the 1800s and there's only two that are from earlier. Um, so and all of these were Niwashi texts and they were kind of uh, held in disrepute or disregard to Japanese garden masters or those that um, were in the profession because they, they kind of simplified Japan to a step-by-step -step sort of diagram. And so like, if you followed these um, images or these descriptions, you can create a Japanese garden. Whereas um, in uh, Japanese gardening tradition, it's, it's like a long process and a long um, uh, internship, like you say, you take 10 years to practically learning to um, the, the art of Japanese gardening from a garden master and it's passed down orally rather than through visual texts or, or written language. So Josiah Kondo was kind of unwittingly an English Niwashi uh, spreading these ideas um, to the British and indeed um, rest of Europe and the US uh, by publishing all of this. is all based on the, the, the garden knowledge you could get hold of at the time when he was writing the book, but it unwittingly kind of uh, spread and further um, enhanced the reach of um, these um, unpracticed as they, as they were uh, regarded Japanese um, self-styled Japanese garden experts. And a lot of the, and well, all, all of the gardens that were built by Japanese in Britain and kind of fall under this Niwashi um, category. So I'll, I'll talk about Japan's European styles in the gardens. Obviously, in this image, it's particularly the, um, what was the supposed German style fountain. Um, I think the originals uh, of these cranes with the water shooting out were, um, were made of cast iron which I think cast iron metal which was used for scrap um, during the second world war so that those aren't the originals but um, obviously you can see the kind of the lawns in the background which like the, the English um, edition however what vibed with most if not all of the the Japanese parks and the incorporated uh, supposed western or European styles or British English ideas they were largely, there would be functional elements such as the lawns for people to um, have picnics on or socialize or relax on. And then they would have things like sporting facilities and uh, things that were more associated with uh, say European parks with kind of active pursuits because Japanese um, outdoor spaces, whilst they did have them, were generally around the kind of the passive uh, places to relax after work or study. And um, so it was this source of, um, you see this in, in Britain where they incorporated in some Japanese areas into British parks. It was like the tranquil area and the active garden. And when they did the opposite in Japan, it was adding these active areas into what was like a normally a, a more tranquil garden area in um, a, a traditional Japanese style garden. Um, this is a, another French style garden at Shinjuku, although uh, this this uh, forms part of uh, the Japanese national um, garden. Uh, it wasn't always, I think it was in the 1830s or 1840s, it was actually designated or and it might have been after the Second World War, it's definitely designated as a um, public park. So it kind of stayed as a, like they had a botanical um, greenhouse, 
and incorporated these European areas. But significantly, some of the um, Japan Society members um, were particularly enamoured with these um, these uh, parks, or, or like Shinjuku in particular, with its um, English lawns and um, French garden. So you kind of find this this place where European ideas of, were being in Japanese parks and gardens were being um, seen by the rich aristocracy and on the tourist trails because these elements were being incorporated into some of the Japanese gardens. So when they were being re when people were recreating images of Japan that they'd seen having visited these gardens, which had European or Western elements in them. They were then recreating partially European and Western elements in the Japan gardens back in Britain, uh, largely because they were basing them on these modern ideas. Um, and this is probably one of my favorite places in Japan. Uh, this is uh, Miranan in Kyoto, but it was uh, Baron Aritomo Yamagata was a chief military figure and um, held lots of um, like important talks in uh, a Western style house that was set next to his traditional Japanese style house, which is kind of behind the image here. Um, but he wanted a garden to be built that incorporated things like the English rolling lawns and um, didn't um, pander too much to what he perceived as kind of traditionally passive and uh, like he wanted um, water balls that were, were really strong, like it was all about the strength and uh, um, power of the garden. Um, and uh, this was one that was visited also by the Earl of, um, Earl of Sandwich at Hinchingbrook House, um, which is why I think he probably mistakenly believed that there were that lawns were a common feature in a lot of Japanese gardens tradition, traditionally. So that's when these uh, Anglo Japanese Alliance hybrid gardens kind of uh, kind of take on their uh, their new role. So like the Ed, as I said, the Edo Meiji era styles of garden were much more ornamental, like even um, which started in the Edo era. Uh, the use of stone lanterns became the most popular motif, like the, the symbolism of stone arrangements and um, uh, island and uh, pond arrangements to signify things became a lot less condensed or taken out altogether and replaced with the kind of showy over ornamented uh, examples like you can see on the uh, the garden of uh, Fukugawa on the left and uh, all the bronze cranes um, in a, on the garden on the right which was uh, Mr. Saigo's garden near Tokyo. Um, so these affected also affected the British understanding of kind of Japanese gardens because they were seen at the contemporary Meiji era and Edo era influence of over ornament, ornamentation and showy styles. So even though like at Lafayette Castle where he kind of stuffed it filled with curios and lanterns and bridges, they were imitating to a degree what, what, what they were seeing in Japan at the time. So kind of criticisms of them being not necessarily traditionally Japanese, uh, they were still based on some Japanese models that they had seen that uh, was, which kind of has some merit. So I, I liked this image from Kinkichiro Honda's um, book on kind of modern styles of Japanese garden um, because he had images of lots of, uh, this is a book that was published in Japan, obviously 1909, as I've said, but here you see kind of geometric beds and uh, a water fountain amidst what, and uh, a circular pool, uh, which are kind of far removed. I don't, I don't know if these were ever actually created in Japan, but um, he'd obviously um, thought of that the, this idea could be um, something that could be achieved or, or, or should be attempted in Japan um, in, in Japanese garden style. So you kind of see this um, juxtaposition of how the emblems of Japan were being used in British garden sites, but then there was also the, the idea of using picking like the Pelican Fountain at um, uh, Hibiya Park in Tokyo there were fountains and kind of Western features that were also similarly put into the Japanese parks and garden sites. Um, so yeah, this, this is my last slide before I finish up, um, but I've kind of argued one of the, a big thing kind of reading on the literature around 
Japan's modernization kind of dis seemed to dismiss the idea that Japan had any park spaces or in a similar vein prior to the Meiji era. Um, whereas my experience and my research of, of kind of looking into it, particularly here at Karaku and Amito, which was completed in 1841, Japan already had a lot of places that, that this was just, this was built by a wealthy Japanese member of aristocracy, uh, but was intended for the use of the kind of wider community to kind of relax and uh, unwind in after work. And again, it's the kind of Japanese uh, passive versus the European supposed active pursuits in park spaces. But then you find a lot of these spaces were repurposed and they would just add the active pursuits in with the Japanese. So you'd have them side by side um, or blended in. So it was, they all kind of feel like um, having been to a lot of the sites and the park sites, they feel like you're in a Japanese garden or extended Japanese garden space, but they've added in the functionality of uh, European and like British ideas, particularly the, the lawns that probably the, the deep offenders and um, kind of rose beds and flower beds you'll kind of see here and there as well in a lot of the, uh, the park spaces that were created in the Meiji era. So, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, I hope from there I've, I've not, I've, I've also tried to attempt to um, condense my thesis into uh, maybe an ambitious uh, 45, 50, or maybe nearly an hour <laughs> talk. But um, yeah, as you can see, it was, uh, hopefully you'll see that it, it was a two way exchange between Japanese politics, and British politics in particular, um, with King Edward VII and Emperor Meiji and all, all these dignitaries um, that uh, drove a lot of the, these Japan gardens. Thank you very much, Luke. It's absolutely fascinating how politics fed into the transmission of ideas and really how difficult it's become with these ideas crossing the oceans to disentangle one influence from the other. Fascinating. Mm. Um, we have some questions, so if I may <laughs> start with it. Um, from Max Caligula, that he says, the French garden still retains very much a Japanese feel. The square expanse of gravel in the middle looks very Japanese. And even in the Muranan, the, the general feel is very Japanese, despite the English lawns. So yeah. it seems to me that the European garden style influenced Japan much less than Japanese style influenced us. What's yes, your opinion uh, on this? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. So um, I think um, it's very much overstated. In fact, even at Hibiya Park, which was styled as the first Western style um, park in Japan was is actually is when you when you go there it's set around these Japanese gardens like the, there were lots of plans to make it more based on like Paris parks or London parks but when they finally built it it, it retained so much of this like you could walk around it and not really perceive anything that wasn't Japanese so they're, they're very much blending blending the kind of foreign influences in so <clears throat> And at Shinjuku, the English lawns, I walked around the whole place and what, what they designated as the English area was literally the lawns. And then they had a few flower beds sort of um, set away um, up uh, near some of the greenhouses they had. But then the rest is all Japanese gardens. And like you say, the French garden with the kind of gravel, like they very much infused it. So I think the, the, the European whilst they are there, I think the Japanese infuse it much more than the British who like to take the emblems and put them in the garden so that you know it's Japanese. They were kind of taking elements, uh, a bit like P.S. Hayward, I guess, kind of learning some of the techniques behind it and incorporating it into the park spaces so that it still fit a fun was functional for Japanese, um, but at the same time, like, it wasn't, wasn't necessarily traditionally like how they would have laid out such a space in Japan. Thank you. Um, for a, a question from David Marsh. Um, what role did commercial nurseries in Japan, like the Yokohama Nursery mm. Company, play in all this, especially given that that one was run by L Louis Burma, a German? Yeah, well, well, it was Louis Burma. Um, 
it was one of his, should we say, disciples. Um, so it was a group of um, Japanese that formed the Okahama Nursery Co. And Louis Burma had his own um, nursery firm. But he kind of gave his blessing for okay, Suzuki to go off and form this with the other Japanese. So even though it was like a rival company, um, but they learned kind of the commercial trading from him, um, which is why you see in the, uh, this is another reason in the 1890s in particular, you see this uh, big surge in Japanese plants in Britain and Japanese style gardens in Britain as well, because uh, they, they kind of learned from uh, Western or uh, like a German uh, nursery firm and then learned how to set up the company themselves and they were very successful and even into the like, 1910 exhibition they were exhibiting vast and providing plants and uh, exhibits for, for them there so they did, did lots of business they, they provided plants for Newstead Abbey in Nottinghamshire as well um, so yeah they were coming as Rico very much um, influential uh, and as an offshoot of uh, Louis Burma to uh, kind of plants and uh, entering Britain and, and elsewhere. Um, thank you. Um, a question from Camilla Beresford. How influential do you think Harold Pito was? Mm. Yeah, so how Pito was, he's in, yeah, he was, he was interesting. As I mentioned, Sedgwick Park, which had the single stone lantern in. His garden commissions were particularly like, so that, that was the first gardening he was associated with, although whether or not the Japan, Japanese stone lantern was placed in after he'd kind of done the water gardens and other things um, isn't necessarily clear, but he kind of, as, as his garden commissions went along at um, Hill House in Wiltshire and Eastern Lodge in uh, Sussex, um, you see more Japanese elements being infused. Although I would say, particularly at Hill House, a lot of that scheme was at the behest of the owner uh, so you kind of see, it's like he wanted to recreate the images of, that you'd seen in Nico, like with the Archbid Bridge, like the Red Bridge and the, the, um, the Thatched House. So you, like, so you certainly got more creative license with later commissions, like uh, uh, his own residence and um, a Wafer Manor, I think it was. Um, you see more Japanese plants and more Japanese schemes being infused, obviously, with his travels in Japan. But um, he, he was certainly influential in um, for other Japanese garden designers, in or British Japanese garden designers like Alfred Parsons, I know, uh, was aware of his work. And there was a lot of intermingling between the um, kind of nursery firms and Japanese garden makers from Britain. So the, the, a lot of them would share commissions or um, uh, take on parts of other jobs or, or kind of use workers that had worked on similar projects. and. Uh, so him and uh, Alfred Parsons, who'd actually been to Japan, kind of got this reputation as um, Japanese garden designers because they'd been there and seen the gardens themselves and uh, as kind of used that to get the commissions. So obviously the early ones where they wanted to put their Japanese stone lanterns or statues in, uh, in and around the garden, you, you kind of see the, the owner's preferences and kind of dictating also is their, their garden so they dictate to a degree and then uh, like so people like Harold Pater would work within those um, kind of briefs or remits to to create the gardens but yeah he, he, there was certainly plenty of I think about five or six sites that were associated to Harold Pater that had a kind of Japanese influence in them. Um, and the next question is from Sophie Varden, and she says she loves the circularity of British garden designs in the early 1900s being influenced by European style gardens they had seen in Japan at the time. Was it known at the time that Japan was incorporating European influences in their gardens? Yeah, I think it would have been, I don't think it would have been widely known. I think the Japanese, particularly the, the political figures at the time, were very happy to spread a positive image of Japan. So like at the exhibitions and things, they, they were very happy to have um, like any positive accord that would, would kind of give them more political standing and more um, power on, on the world stage. So I think when like the, the British dignitaries would go to these gardens, I don't think it would have necessarily been widely known, especially with Josiah Condor's book, which was using a lot of um, 
these new ashi texts and images uh, and the modern styles of uh, garden. So I think some of the more studied, like Lord Reedsdale, as I said, who kind of did his blended hybrid at Batsford Park in Gloucestershire um, and, and said he doesn't have a Japanese garden. Like there were a few that were outspoken on the subject like that. But in the main, a lot of them were just taken with the uh, the nature, the the wistful gardens of the Japanese. So I think if they'd seen and like enjoyed, it's obviously the the lawns and things that they had in in these new styles of Japanese gardens in the media. A lot of the diplomats had, like Miranan and elsewhere, also served as kind of a social function where they could kind of gather and enjoy the scenery and have their kind of diplomatic negotiations next to. So I think. Um, I'd, particularly for uh, the higher up dignitaries, I don't think they perceived too much that these were in fact got sort of like new creations that they were mimicking. Um, the next question to Jean Jamin. Um, really interesting research. Thank you very much, Luke. My question was inspired by the honored lecture of Professor Wu Hong on the Humanist Day of University of Chicago. Um, so he mentioned a very interesting thing that unlike Europeans, indeed in pre-modern China, only portable painting and calligraphy were considered works of art and avidly collected. I guess the situation in Japan was very similar. The, Chap the Chinese learned the definition of work of art actually through Japanese when after the modernization and westernization in Japan and the schools of art were established and the researches were supported and that the Japanese started to do the survey and field works in China from the end of the 19th century. So my question is, in case of your research on the gardens, how did the Japanese come to recognize the aesthetic value of garden art? Was it because of the Japan opened and the visiting of Europeans in Japan? And how did that process happen? Mm. The second question, but perhaps you'd like to ask, answer that one first. Yeah. So that's an interesting question. Obviously, um, with, with Japan opening, they and employing so many Western or like European American uh, figures to learn about like architecture and art. I think it's it, it certainly was inevitable. Like 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 I said earlier, it it did feed into things like how Kinkajiro Honda. Um, infused modern ideas into the garden like uh, kind of more western ideas so obviously pre obviously well, originally japan learned a lot from china uh, like from the earlier parts of history so obviously japanese gardens and japanese arts is heavily influenced by chinese art and calligraphy and uh, so i think they obviously it, it will have morphed and changed and become, become more distinctly Japanese over time. But yeah, I think there was a profound effect of the Western um, Oyatoi, as they were termed, like the teaching um, Japanese, a kind of different way of, uh, you see it at the exhibitions as well with like the art that they're displaying, because um, they were taking on more kind of mimicking what Europeans were doing at their exhibitions, such as um, for example, things like native villages, like they'd have Taiwanese and um, hamlets and uh, Ainu um, houses and things like they 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 were starting to do the so kind of show the same things to so that they could be perceived as an equal power. So I think it, I suppose that's that's where it, it all kind of draws from. It's this kind of wanting to not be perceived as backwards, so that Japan can have better trade deals, better world standing and that in turn meant kind of learning different ways of uh, like relate to your question to do with art um, learning set like how some a lot, a lot of Japanese kind of artists did um, kind of live in London for a time and then went back to Japan and uh, obviously vice versa artists in Britain going to Japan um, and learning their types of art but yeah I'd, I, I do think that would have had a profound impact on, as you say, on how it's then transmitted back to a place like China and uh, elsewhere. The, the second part of the, this question is um, 
the, the sort of the, the mesh of Japan and China coming through again. Um, did you ever study the phrase Sharawaji? Uh, do you think there's any connection between Sharawaji and the word uh, Nuwashi? I guess, no, I didn't study that, I'm afraid. <laughs> I might have to concede on this one. <laughs> um, Max Caligula, another quick question. The garden in Surrey you showed, um, does, I think it, he said he can't remember the name. It had a photo of the Japanese equivalent beside it. I think that was your castle, was it? But he oh, asked that um, still exists. Oh, might have been Buckhurst Park. Park. Might have been. But the one with the country life um, zigzag bridge, I presume. Is it? Yeah, Buckhurst Park, sorry. Yeah. Max, is, it, is that the one? Um, does that still exist, he asks? I... That's a good question, actually. It's not, no, I don't believe so, because it's not one that I attempted to visit. Okay. So I think it, I, I don't believe it exists anymore. Okay. Um, I think with a lot of them, like like Rufford Abbey as well, they, um, like if, if, particularly if like estates got sold, um, a lot of the time they just demolish, demolish what was there or, or some of them, because they only had a stone lantern in in the first place, it was quite easy to then take that out. And then you've just got like a, a water garden or, or whatever. But that's, that's kind of where, where some of them derived all their Japanese um, connotations from. It's like once you take the stone lantern and the tea house out, it's just a, a water or rock garden. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's me kind of going off on a, on a tangent there. <laughs> um, it's from Christian Tagsold. Uh, thanks a lot for the inspiring presentation. I'd like to generalize Max's question, if I may. How are the gardens you introduce preserved today? Are many of them included in heritage schemes on a regional or national level? The Japanese government a couple of years ago set up a pr program to preserve international Japanese gardens. Does that help in the UK? It doesn't in Germany, he says. <laughs> yeah, I think, oh, this is when the um, automatic light goes off. My one technical glitch. <laughs> Um, Shilling at the meter. So yes, uh, in, in terms of, I, I think the only one I can, the main ones I can think of that still exist, like Tatton Park, which is National Trust. So they kind of obviously fell into decay for a number of years, but National Trust have kind of got own, ownership of that one. And um, Nottinghamshire Council have, uh, have got the Newstead Abbey site. I think one of the Scottish councils have got Calvin Castle. They're, they're probably the three main big ones from, say, Victorian Edwardian era, anyway, they're existing. But I think a lot of them were just left to, as you say, uh, decay and uh, fall into disrepair or disappear. I mean, in fact, I think Tatton Park, they had to, like, they rediscovered it or, <laughs> or how you rediscover a garden, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but, um, and then recreated it based on the images and uh, things like that. But I, I don't think there's, I think that actually, I know there was one at Valley Gardens in um, Harrogate that the, their council or, or there was some funding that they then renovated that, but that, that was more of a, a 1920s example. So it slightly fell out of my remit because I was looking at 1850 to 1914. But um, I think there are some little pockets of them here and there. But yeah, in, in, in the main, I don't think there's been any huge drive to preserve or uh, indeed uh, kind of had funding on a national level. Um, the, ne the next question sort of follows on maybe because of the period you were studying. Um, Camilla Beresford asks if you came across um, Sayamon Kasamoto or Kusamoto. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he started working in England in the 20s and was involved yeah. in the Festival of Britain. Have you come across him? Yeah, yeah, so briefly, because um, he, he was fun. There was there was a couple of um, Japanese that came and worked in Britain. Um, uh, obviously, he was slightly out of my remit, but I did like as he worked on um, Cotterhead in Hertfordshire, um, which uh, was originally started by a merchant um, called Herbert Good, and he um, had lots of Japanese ornaments and a Japanese kind of scheme. And the same when Kasumoto was hired to kind of improve that, like in the 1920s, and sort of expand it. Um, so you kind of get some Japanese uh, figures that would come and um, I think it was a Jihei Suzuki worked on the Phantoms Hall um, and some other sites, but a lot of the time they would come and work on sites that were already existing 
Um, so some of them worked, I think Soma Kasamoto, we created a lot more, I think he, he did some uh, Karasansui dry stone gardens, uh, which weren't really seen in the Victorian Edwardian era, they were I think, probably a bit too abstract for um, for the kind of early Japan gardens. Um, but this, they certainly started to be more of those from the 1920s onwards. But yeah, his his work, um, work well, on quite a lot of sites was more influential in that period. Like, so I'm not as familiar with it because I kind of had to, even though I was like, oh, there's more Japanese gardens I can look into, I kind of had to put them to one side and focus on um, my uh, kind of First World War buffer, uh, as, as I put it, because it kind of changed and, and also King Edward VII and Emperor Meiji died in 1910 and 1912 respectively, so it was kind of the end of the Meiji um, direct political influence because there were two new eras uh, kind of taking place after that. Okay, great. Um, Melissa Hay asks if there that she comments that there seems to be no absorption of the religious philosophical aspect of the Japanese garden as it was expressed in Britain or have you found any examples of this having been the case? So I suppose the short answer is no. Uh, the, the long answer is it kind of feeds in from the say the politics around it and also the contemporary gardens so particularly Edo and Meiji era gardens, uh, they sort of consciously did away with a lot of the symbolism in favor of the overall ornamentation, like the stone lanterns and uh, kind of having lots of bridges and, and it was, it's kind of very much over, over ornamentation became the, the trend and the style. So even in Japan at that time, there wasn't as much, like obviously in the, the older gardens, you would still find it, but in the newer gardens, particularly the ones that a lot of the dignitaries and aristocracy were seeing, it was these modern styles of overall ornamented um, garden. So the symbolism wasn't necessarily there in the gardens that the British were seeing anyway, although they could learn a bit about it from some of the books and the texts of the time, like Josai Ponder's book. And uh, um, it was, it, it didn't really feature, it was the, the visual elements, like say the stone lanterns where the, the key and the offender of the tea house and like bronze cranes, things like that. So yeah, they very much took over any of the sort of traditional spiritual uh, side of things. Thank you. Um, we have one more comment, um, Luke, but maybe you'd like to put up your final slide, your final slide again, so people have got oh, yeah. your contact details. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, I forgot I'd gotten back, gone back across to, <laughs> For, uh, but yes, my thesis is open access. <laughs> um, so just, just to add to that um, from Arabella, that the Japanese Garden Society can help with further um, further info, read the gardens at uh, www.jgs.org.uk. Um, and thank you very much from Camilla Beresford and thank you very much from all of us, actually, for once again, absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm sure we will be rushing to read, <laughs> read your um, your thesis, get get even more information. Um, so so yeah, very interesting into the, in, insight into how the how the, the different ideas crossed and how they were translated or mistranslated. Um, so can I thank you very much? Um, and, but before we all wrap up, I'd like to remind everyone that our next meeting is on the 16th of December, when Dr. Kristen Tagsall will, relevantly enough, be speaking on um, turning J gardens in, J into, in Japan into Japanese gardens. Um, and some people may be interested to know that there are two talks um, being held by the Gardens Trust. One is tomorrow and on Japanese gardens, this is one's tomorrow oh, and the other is on the 9th of December. So with that, thank you all very much, everybody, for, for being there. And um, once again, thank you very much, Luke. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
I think I've got stuck now. Stuck where? There we are. Oh, I, I, nothing happened, but now it's happening. Just trying to get more side by side people. Oh. Um, gallery, there we are. Oh, that's it. Well, look, that was really fascinating. So thank you very much. Oh, good. Oh, yeah, that's it. I hope you hope you all enjoyed it. <laughs> Absolutely. Luke, I have a follow on question, if I may. You know, the question about um, I can't remember who asked it and um, being um, Melissa Hay, sorry, but um, saying that she was unable to perceive any absorption of the religious and the philosophical meaning that a Japanese garden in Japan or Japan garden or whatever we're calling it would have um, here. Uh, does it matter? I mean, you've thought about this a lot, I'm sure. It, I mean, without it, what are we doing? Or is it fine just to go on the aesthetic kind of level? Yeah, I think, I mean, well, ultimately, I suppose if you, like, like I said, turn them Japan gardens because they're sort of, you're one in two, right? So you like a Japanese aesthetic, you like the gardens, or you like some of the techniques, so you're infusing them in this space. So I suppose if it's if it's that aesthetic you like, then I guess it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I, I think most, I, I think the Japan garden categories almost stemmed out of, because um, I did a, a, in my pieces, I have a chapter on authenticity and what was perceived as inauthentic gardens at the time, like in the Edwardian Victorian era. So you get lots of people, uh, like particularly in the press or, or critics of, of those that are making Japan, Japan gardens or Japanese gardens in Britain. Um, and so it's, but yeah, I think ultimately you could, I, I think you should only really infuse the spiritual or the like the religious elements if you are, say, particularly attached to that kind of spiritual or religious elements, I guess, because then it would make sense Otherwise, you're just kind of copying, I guess, the empty shell of it to a degree, maybe. And I suppose the follow on question, just being a bit argumentative, not with you, but with with my own question is, well, yeah. why isn't it good enough to just aesthetically um, appreciate, you know, a, a certain type of garden and, and do it? Yeah. I mean, it would take us all a lifetime to understand Shinto and Buddhism if, if we hadn't been raised in that. Um, but we might love all the other bits of it, as you're as you're saying, you know. Mm. Yeah, no, I think. Yeah, well, that's that's basically it. I think you, I say Japanese gardens are in Japan. And then <clears throat> what I'm saying is Japan gardens are in Britain, but they like there's nothing wrong with having a Japan garden in a way. Cause it's just. Mm. Like you're interested in the culture and you're interested in mm. how they set out these gardens, whether or not it's what you're doing is perceived as authentic or um, necessarily correct. I think if you're kind of hybridizing and fusing things together anyway, that's that's like, whereas some, obviously some of them would, uh, the aristocracy would just kind of mimic what they'd seen. But I think if you're kind of infusing things like uh, into like your in the English garden scheme or, or, or whatever else, it's it's kind of a per it's, it, ultimately it's a personal thing, isn't it? So, look, can I ask you? You you mentioned something about uh, that that was orally transmitted, really the uh, the, the craft of of garden. Yeah. Um, was that was there much written down, or it was it mostly orally transmitted? I mean, it's a, it's an oral tradition as opposed to a written tradition. Yeah, I think there weren't. Um, uh, this is the right phrase. They weren't supposed to write it down, I guess. Like there was the, the earliest kind of garden making manuals, the 11th from the 11th century called the Sakiteki, which um, details a lot of gardening, which is kind of, they were kind of secret scrolls in themselves, like that would, um, but and they kind of explain the taboos in garden making and things like this, and where, like, based on the Chinese geomantic principles and all the rest of that, they're kind of explaining how a garden should be set up, but like still be original. So I think it, it was, it's kind of 
that I think they, they orally would transmit like from master to disciple and purely to kind of keep, I suppose in a way it keeps it in the house as well, like you're not got all the garden secrets out there. And also I suppose for the kind of fine tuning of the art or whatever, it's kind of learning that way. Mm -hmm. They, I think in many ways it was kind of a, a way of retaining the knowledge within the the kind of the, the guild or the craft or the um, sort of keeping it in house. So so when they started writing these texts, like the Nuashi texts, the ones that Josai Konda made use of, of uh, lots of them, it was kind of was kind of met with a bit of outrage from uh -huh. uh, traditional Japanese garden designers because it's kind of simplifying. Uh, what they've been doing for generations or kind of handing it down and also encouraging copying, which I think was the main criticism of it. It kind of, because they, a lot of them, they make these plans uh, for certain types of garden. So it's like, oh, we can follow it step by step and make a Japanese garden or make a garden. Whereas it was always kind of working with the owner of the garden's wishes and working within these principles, like whether it be the, the geomantic or the taboo uh, elements. To, to make an original garden. So I think it, it, was, it was kind of stems from that. It's the, the copying and uh, that these texts encouraged. Right, well, thank you very much. I've got a slightly more flippant question, but um, were there lots of cherry, was it possible to have cherry trees at the exhibitions? I think they, they certainly, I think for a thing like exhibition, I know they imported over like thousands and thousands of plants, but I think getting them to um, kind of be embedded and in any fit state to to kind of do anything. So a lot, a lot of the time you'll see them in kind of potted plants or kind of placed around. You see smaller um, like bonsai trees placed around to get in the kind of the place of um, like full grown cherry trees. Um, also, I think cherry trees could be cultivated in uh, Britain by, by 1910 because of like Yokohama Nursery Co. So they might, I think, probably would have had saplings and things for sale. But yeah, in terms of the gardens themselves, I know they struggled in the construction to kind of have as many plants. So it kind of did end up being mostly the tea houses, the structures, the stone lanterns, the bridges. Thank you. Could I ask one more one question? And this will sound flip, but I don't, I'm just really trying to get the most out of you possible, <laughs> um, which is what, what do you have any views on Monet's garden and his Japanese bridge and his, oh, yeah. you know, his study of Japan? Or have, is that, have you had to push that to the side? I saw, yeah, it was, it was another one I had to push to the side, I think, because it was ever so slightly later, wasn't it? Was it the 1920s? Am I wrong in that? No, no, he starts. He, start, he starts earlier, but because if it wasn't in Britain, that might have been why. I yeah, it's probably because it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I kind of had. Yeah, there was quite a few. There was a, the only one I did talk about was uh, Klingendal in the Netherlands because it was inspired by the 1910 exhibition. So mm -hmm. I was able oh, to see the Japanese ones, but yeah, there was a lot that I had to kind of um, um, put to one side. It's got like whole other folders on my. Um, <laughs> the research of the PhD stuff that have just kind of I found this thing on Japan but I've just got to put it on one side and <laughs> I leave it there for a bit that's for the that, book. that's good that's right you've got somewhere to go <laughs> that's <laughs> great yeah I, I, I think the questions I think we've covered I don't think I missed anybody out apart from a lot of thank yous <laughs> <laughs>